But today we are continuing in our James series, and uh, as I was preparing the message, um, the beginning of, of this message, I, I was reminded about uh, some movies that I've seen. You guys like movies? You're like a, a big movie buff. Uh, um, in England, we call them films. You're welcome. Um, but uh, one of my favorite types of movies is bank heist movies. Oh, I love bank heist movies. Now, I'm not a proponent for bank robbery, so don't send me emails and tell me that's bad. I get it. Nobody should rob banks, but some movies are just fun to watch. And uh, I was thinking about some of the classic movies. Classic is always a, a weird term because it depends on how old you are to what classics are. Uh, but uh, some classic bank heist movies. Um, and uh, um, I was thinking about that. And, and every bank heist movie has these, uh, these safety deposit boxes that always blow me away. Because I never think about safety deposit box movies unless, uh, safety deposits, unless I'm watching a movie. And I always am left with this thought, what do people put in a safety deposit box? You ever wondered that? Maybe you have one and you're like, well, I'd put this, this, and this. But I would love to be able to go into a bank at any moment and just walk up and, and choose one box just to see what's in it. The only interaction that I've ever had with a safety deposit box is um, when I was proposing to my wife. Um, now, that seems like a weird start to a story, right? Weird proposal. But my wife was promised her, her Grammy's ring, uh, engagement ring. Her, her Grammy's husband died many years ago, and so she stopped wearing it. And apparently, rings are what you put in a safety deposit box. And so I, I went and set up a time to meet with her to, to ask uh, if it was okay to use the ring. And, and uh, um, apparently, it needed two meetings. So the first meeting, we met for coffee, and I think she was vetting me. She was like... Uh, <laughs> Are you, and and uh, she wanted to make sure that if it didn't work out, that I would make sure Terry got the ring back. I get it, um, but it's going to work out. It's working out, and I love it. Uh, but I had to have a second meeting um, to, to get permission to ask my wife to marry me with uh, my, her Grammy's ring. And so the second time, we went to the safety deposit box at the bank, and uh, I waited outside, and she went in, and she made sure she had a key, because this is what People don't always know, but what do you need with a safety deposit box? Two keys. Oh, maybe you knew that, but not everybody does. And, and when you go into the bank, they, they, they have a key, and you have a key. And if you don't have your key, you're in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> you got to come in and prove who you are and all this kind of stuff to get a new key. But, but as I was reading this text today, and as James is writing this letter, there is such a great illustration he uses here. He looks at this and he says that when it comes to the, the valuable thing that God wants you to have in your life, this valuable thing of godly, genuine Christian living, he's saying there's two keys needed to access it. Just like a safety deposit box, he's saying if you only have one of these keys, you're not going to access the genuine Christian living that he has for us. And those two things are, are simple the things you do every day, and yet I promise you they're things that you struggle with at least every week. The two keys are this. The first one is hearing, verses 19 through 21, and the second one is doing. Now, here's the problem. If you have one without the other, you can't get access to what God wants for you. Sounds pretty dramatic, but we'll see in Scripture that that's, that's true. You ever seen somebody who um, works out but only works out the upper body? Like just the arms, and they're like jacked, like big guy, but they're like big upper body, small waist, little legs, and like they waddle along. It's like they're going to topple over at any moment. Yeah, you ever seen someone like that? Uh, uh, that, that literally is like someone who, who just focuses on one thing and misses the other. And this is what James wants us to remember today and really focus on. In order to live the life God is calling you, you need both these keys hearing and doing. Now, you know this if you're married, that there's an importance to hearing, but there's a greater importance, I think, to doing, right? Anybody interacted uh, that way with their spouse recently? I heard you. I know you wanted me to do that. I even acknowledged, I, I had a whole conversation with you. Well, why didn't you take the trash out then? Yikes. Hearing and doing, right? Two keys. Hearing plus doing leads to a genuine Christian living. However, one without the other, you're going to have problems. 
if you're acting, you don't know what you're doing, you, you, you've not heard the good news and you're just doing random things, that's not going to be good. We uh, have, have kind of looked at the context of what James is writing to, and I think it's important that we remind ourselves of this each week, because it, it's 15 years after Jesus died, and James writes this letter. And the people he's writing to, they, they were a part, mostly a part of the Jerusalem church, but then came this persecution. So all these people, they scattered, and, and they were suffering, and they were standing out where they had to go. They were, they were refugees, actually. We talked about that last week, right? That we still have refugees in our world. And, and here, maybe in America, we don't quite often think about refugees as much. But these people were religious refugees, being persecuted for what they believed in. They had to flee with what they could carry on their backs. And James, who was most likely their pastor, a prominent Jewish Christian leader. He led the church in Jerusalem. He's writing this letter, and what is interesting is these people are scattered in many different regions, many different like small gatherings, and yet James only writes one letter. He doesn't write many letters to, to hit all the different nuances to the different areas. He writes one. And it's interesting to note that he does this because what is this telling us? It's telling us that whatever James has for us, the truth, is relevant no matter where you are, no matter the circumstance you find yourselves in. Because maybe today you're sitting in like, well, I'm not persecuted. I'm not flee. I'm not a refugee. I'm not any of this stuff. Well, I want you to know that, that you don't have to be in the exact same situation as the people he's writing to, to learn from God's truth today. It is relatable to every single one of us in this room, if we're willing to hear, if we're willing to listen. And so he's writing this letter and saying, no matter the persecution, no matter what you're going through, no matter where life has taken you today, here is the truth that God has for you. That's what I want you to hear today. And so our memory verse through this series, it, it really helps sum up the book of James. We, we talked about this tagline that James has, keep the faith. No matter what life looks like, keep the faith. James is, is really a, a, a call to Christian living and how to live that way. And so our memory verse in James 1.4, let's put it up and why don't we read this out loud together. It goes like this. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You feel mature and complete today? <laughs> Maybe ask the person sitting next to you and see what, if your answers align. Mature and complete. Don't give up. Keep the faith. And so today we jump into verse 19 and James, his approach is, is amazing. I love this. It says in verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. You realize in life how much approach matters? Like you may have something great to tell something, someone. You may have great news, important things, like something someone needs to hear. But if your approach isn't loving, don't they just switch off? They don't listen, right? And I love how James does this. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, friends, take note of this. He was their pastor in Jerusalem. They loved him. He loved them. He's sharing this, this important truth with them, this, this letter with them, and, and his approach about something tough he's going to share is key. So maybe you've experienced this uh, if you're married. Um, there's, there's a moment in life for a guy that you dread, and uh, it, it's when you're about to go out to somewhere nice, you're going to a party, a function, a date, and, and your wife has bought something new that you've not seen before, and she's not sure if it looks good on her. And there's this interaction that happens, maybe you've experienced this, where, where she'll put it on and my wife's beautiful. And she'll come in front of you and your, your spouse will come in front of you and say, hey, does this look good on me? Now, if you've never prepared yourself for that moment, you, you should think about it right now and prepare yourself to know how to respond to that moment. Because there's going to come a time in your life when your spouse puts something on and, and it doesn't look flattering. Now, how do you respond to that? Do you just quickly run away and close the door? <laughs> do you say, don't worry, I'm not going tonight, I feel sick? No! Your approach matters, right? lovingly share the truth. Your wife didn't want to marry a liar. She doesn't want you to lie. And people always say, oh, there's, there's good lies. No, there's not. <laughs> lies are sinful. 
but there's good approach. Hey, babe, you are beautiful, but I don't think that, that this outfit is your best. Like, e- even I'm cringing a little bit as I say it. It's uncomfortable, <laughs> right? How do you share the truth lovingly? We use silly examples to help us get to the meat, right? And this is where it gets tricky. If someone in your life is acting sinful, how do you approach it? Come up to them like, hey, bro, you're being, you're being a silly person. I can't say bad words, can I? You're being such and such. You're doing such and such. This is wrong. What are you doing? Are you this way? Like, the approach matters. James is in relationship with these people, and yet he approaches them. He knows a hard truth's coming, but he starts off in a loving way. I think many of us can learn from that today. Before we even get into what it said, the truth, your approach matters. Do you love them? We are called to come and love people generously. Love is grace and truth. We share the truth, but in a, in a graceful way. There's times to confront, absolutely. But it matters. Being led by the Spirit, knowing how to approach someone. And James, I think I believed it enough, he comes and, and he confronts them. Now, remember the spirit of what is being said. It, it is of love and edification that he writes this letter, not of harm. And yet, he's sharing a confrontation with them. Now, here's the thing with Scripture. Oftentimes, it convicts because God's, God's Word is living and breathing and the Spirit is working in your life. And as you read it, you'll read something and you'll be like, no, I didn't want to hear that because that convicts me. I don't want to act that way. I want to I want to act this way. I want to say this. I want to do this. And yet it doesn't align with Scripture. And then you get all offended, right? The person who shares it with you. It is not my words. It's the Word of God. So don't get annoyed at me. Um, If these verses confront you, know that God is working in your heart, right? He loves you and He wants what's best for you. He knows what's best for you. But we often, but often there are important things we need to hear whether we like it or not. Here's the important part in in verse 19 through 20. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. It's important. Everyone should be what? Quick to listen. Are you quick to listen? Slow to speak, slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Here's the important line, right? Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry and this is the first key in order to access what, the, what God wants for your life, genuine Christian living. The first key is hearing, hearing. Let me ask you this. Have you ever asked a question because you already know the answer and you want to tell someone the answer? We do that, right? We ask questions and, and we not genuinely want to hear what someone has to say. We not genuinely want to grow and lovingly connect and we just want them to know the answer. We know that it's better approached in a question form, right? It's interesting. We, we ask these questions, things like, uh, why are you so mean? What kind of question is that? It's a question where you want to tell them why they're so mean. I'll tell you why you're so mean. Why are you so mean? Didn't you say you would do that? Well, is that a question or a statement? Didn't you say you would do that? Yes, you did. It was a week ago, and here is the text message to prove it. That's how we work, right? Oftentimes, we ask questions, not because we want to hear what the other person has to say, but because we want to hit them with the truth. Um, I think the best part about the political debate was the fact that they had microphones that could be muted. Change things, right? But that's all I'll say on this for today. It's interesting (laughs) how we ask questions because we just want to come and yell louder. If I yell the loudest, then I'm right. Oh, that's not what he's saying. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. We can learn to be slow to anger by first learning to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Are you quick to listen these days? Are you quick-witted? We, we elevate people that are quick-witted, right? Like stand-up comics or like people who, who think fast. We're like, oh, I want to think fast. Always got to come back. Always got this. Always know what to say. Sometimes you need to just be hearing. A couple of things that I try and tell myself that, that I struggle with when, when I'm frustrated. When there's people I love, I, I remind myself, trust positive intentions. 
Just because they're interacting a certain way and it's coming across a certain way doesn't mean they hate you. It just means you need to listen and ask questions and really hear what's going on. Oftentimes, the people that, that hurt you the most are the ones that are hurting the most. And you don't even know it. It changes the interaction, right, when you realize what someone else is going through. Oh, you just lost a loved one? Doesn't make it right how they treat you, but at least you can understand what they're going through. Another thing that I try and try, I'll say try, I'll remind you that I'm trying, to admit that I'm not always right. That's a hard one. What about you guys? Do you admit that maybe in this scenario, you might not know the whole truth. You might not know everything. Quick to listen. Hear. James is implying that a basic reality of life is this. You are going to be offended at some point and you're going to offend someone at some point. That's a basic reality in life, right? Triggered, offended. Um, the problem comes though when, when a lot of us live our lives like we're a, a, a soda can that's sh shaken up, right? Like you live your life on the verge of erupting. Are you frustrated? Like how short is your fuse these days? Now, oftentimes when, when life gets stressful, things are going on at work, with family, financial issues, when, when, when you're just baseline annoyed, what happens? Something sets you off. The only way to relieve it, usually, that we choose is to open the can and it spews over everybody. Not over the people that actually frustrate and annoy us. Usually, it's over the people that love us the most that are standing close to us. That baseline of frustration. And James uses this word anger, um, or gay, an emotional reaction triggered by someone else. And so how do we deal with the person that offends me? You ever ask yourself that? How do I deal with the person that offends me? Usually not well, I think is the realistic answer. But what if we prepared for those interactions? How can I deal with someone who offends me? Well, first and foremost, he gave us, God gave us two ears and two eyes and one mouth. God was playing the math, right? Use them. Listen. Look. Before you speak, hear. The truth is, much of our anger comes from being self-centered instead of others-centered. And so quick to hear is a way to be others-centered. Slow to speak is a way to be others-centered. Slow to anger, not anger at all, because there's a righteous anger and an unrighteous anger, right? But slow to, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And this is why, in verse 20, that James really is hammering this home. He knows it's important. And why? Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. If you want to live a genuine Christian life, if you want to be like Jesus, this is a part of it. Now, it may not produce what God desires, but anger sometimes produces what I desire, right? We get angry because I'm self-centered. And I want you to know, you frustrated me. Now, if you really want to know what anger is like, go drive towards East Derry, and there's this thing called a traffic circle. <laughs> and if you drive on that traffic circle, you realize that apparently in, in the country of America, when you learn how to drive, they don't take you on traffic circles. In England, we call them roundabouts, and there's many of them, and you know how to use them. I get angry. I'm getting a little, a little heated right now, actually. <laughs> um, anger. The problem is, oftentimes, my anger is being fueled by my self-centeredness. You didn't do this, it impacted me this way. You said this, and I believe this. What if we were able to interact in a way where we're really hearing what someone else is saying? Not just listening to the words, but hearing it. Before we share our opinion, maybe try this week, just try it, see. Before you share and speak your opinion, why don't you wait and hear someone else's? I'm not saying they're right. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it won't make you frustrated. But try it. See what happens. And we'll get a little more into this in a second. But the difference is, what you value, you'll be gentle with. What you value, you'll put in a safety deposit box, some way of safeguarding it. Think about it. 
What do you park in the garage? You park the car that's worth the most, usually. Or you value your spouse, your wife, and so she parks in there because then she can have the nice parking spot in the garage. What do you value is what you treat gently. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. If we want to live like Jesus and and please God, we need to start changing how we live. Because it's not a natural disposition to be other-centered, is it? It's just not. We we were at a cookout uh, yesterday with uh, my wife's part of a mom's group, and there was lots of um, moms, and this was the, the dads came with the moms to a cookout, and so it's, uh, we'd never met any of the other dads, so it was um, everything you'd expect it to be. And um, we, we put the babies down, and no, it was fun, actually, and we put the babies down, and, and it's funny to watch them interact, because babies don't naturally, like, think about being considerate to other babies, that's why you say gentle hands, even though they have no idea what it means yet, because they're like smacking the, my son loves hair. And we have nursery volunteers that look after my, my son in nursery during service, and he will go, and uh, he, especially like Enzo Scott's red hair, he will grab his hair and he will eat his hair, because <laughs> he loves it. He's, he doesn't know what it means to be gentle, considerate. It's not natural, and neither do we, honestly. Naturally, we don't choose to hear first, to be slow to speak, slow to become angry. We are so naturally self-centered. And yet in verse 21, James knows this, so he starts this progression where he's explaining it. He says, therefore, so if we want to be this way, therefore, here's what to do. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly except the word planted in you, which can save you. Now, most of us probably don't evaluate our life with like a a good category and a moral filth category. (laughs) We like to sugarcoat it a little bit, right? It's like, oh, here's the good things I do, and here's things I need to grow in. James is like, no, 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 that growth column, that's called moral filth, that's sin. Like, call it what it is. And in here, he's saying, not just like clean yourself up so you wear your Sunday best and look good on a Sunday. He says, get rid of it all. Throw it away. Change. The Christian faith is not a moralistic behavior modification faith. It is a life change built on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God created our world, and it was good. And out of it, God allowed free will. And we chose badly. Sin came into the world. Everything changed. And yet Jesus came in and he changed everything for the better. And this is what we're talking about here. That if you want to follow Jesus, if you want to be more like him, if you want to do what pleases God, then you have to change the way you are living. But you can't just do it on your own. He goes on to explain it. You have to accept the gift. And the Spirit will change you. But if you're still living the exact same way you were before you were a Christian, I would ask you to really reflect and wonder, have I really been changed? Life change is what happens. The words you speak, the actions you do, the thoughts you have. Now, don't get me wrong, I still have sinful thoughts sometimes. I still do bad things sometimes, because we all do. Sin is not inevitable, but life change means Little by little, you're becoming more like Jesus as you get rid of all the old desires. Filling yourselves with the Word. It says, and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the Word planted in you. Accept or receive. This is the key verse. We we talk about being a beacon of truth. The only truth we have is not your truth. You, You ever have people explain, like, give you an answer to something, and it's like, well, here's what I feel. Here's what I believe. If what you believe and feel is not based on the Word of God, then it's wrong. That's all I have. God's Word planted in our heart. This is what matters. Charles Spurgeon, he's a famous British theologian, he says this, the first thing then is receive. That word receive is a very instructive gospel word. It is the door through which God's grace enters to us. We're not saved by working, but by receiving. Not by what we give to God, but by what God gives to us, and we receive from Him. Problem is, we live in a country that is much more about doing than it is about receiving. 
Now, doing matters, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But if you hear the Word of God, you can receive it like a seed planted in you. How much time, though, do you spend reading God's Word? Now, I know that's a very church question, right? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, read the Bible, such a churchy thing. It is, but there's a reason why. Because the Bible is God's Word, and it is His food for our soul. It is His truths, His promises. It is everything that God has for us is in there, and we need to grow and let the Spirit share it with us in our hearts. Um, but often we're too busy for it, right? Um, we spend our lives pretty busy. You, you, you're pretty busy in life, running from one thing to the next. And busyness isn't always good, is it? I had a friend who went to the beach recently, and he said that he was at the beach enjoying it. It was beautiful, and he looked around, and he was the only one not staring at a screen. And he just, he just hurt him in his soul. <laughs> Enjoy what God has given us, absolutely. But spend time in his word. Come to the word and hear God's truths, his promises. Uh, this same friend uh, was speaking to my wife, and, and he mentioned that, that he has a goal for how many times he's going to read the Bible in his life. At a, by a certain age, he wants to have read the Bible this amount of times. And I thought about it, and I was like, that's genius. I've never thought about that. I love it. And so I've not come up with my goal yet. And it's not about the number, right? Like sometimes we read through the Bible and we want to check off that little box. you that type of person. I read it, but did you breathe it? Did you reflect on it? It's not about the goal being accomplished. It's about spending time with God, learning from Him, growing in what He has for us. It is food for our soul. And we don't want to be top heavy, like the guy that works out and he can't hardly walk. <laughs> we want to be living a life that is genuine Christian life. Christian living is not just going to church, being in a small group, giving some money or volunteering here and there. It is much more than that. It is feeding on His Word because there is power in God's Word. It's not just like a novel. It is a powerful book, living and breathing. So what does your time in the Word look like? We have these, uh, these bushes in our front yard. Um, I think they're pretty ugly. They're like all branches and a couple of leaves. Um, but once a year, for a couple of weeks, they flourish and these white flowers come and they're beautiful. Now, I don't think it's worth it, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> it is interesting how when the Word is planted in you, if you are growing in it, it starts to flourish. It doesn't change everything. Like, you, you still kind of do some things where you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. You still repent. You still ask for forgiveness. There's still that that goes on, that, that ongoing becoming more like Jesus. But when you are planted, when the Word is planted in you and you allow it to flourish, it starts to change things. And James says that spiritual power of the Word of God, when it's planted in your heart, it is able to save souls. So this is the first key, hearing. But hearing without the second key, doing, well, is worthless, is what James says. We'll, we'll see that. So the second key that we have today, if we want to live like Jesus, live a genuine Christian life, we have to hear the Word, but also put it into practice. Do it. Doing. Um, I think you've probably interacted with the difference between not doing what you've heard. We talked about that before. We had this recently. My wife and I went to the beach. Uh, we were taking our son to the beach for the first time, like a big thing that you have to put on Instagram. And it... It was great, and, and we, we, we started to go, and she had a list of things we needed to take, and I never realized how much stuff kids need, um, and uh, so we filled up the car, and, and, and I went off the list, and, and she, she goes, hey, make sure you bring the tent, and, and said, okay, yeah, it's in the basement, and I, I heard it. See where this is going? My wife, she did her job and, and communicated effectively, both in written and verbal form. I heard it. I acknowledged it about 10 minutes into our drive. Guess what I did? A U-turn. <laughs> because I didn't do it. Hearing without doing, man, that's problematic. Even more so when it comes to your faith. If you hear the Word of God, if, it, if, if you've heard it, but you're not doing it, has it changed you? Here's what James says in verse 22. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Well, that's a key word right there, isn't it? Deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. 
But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So put simply, when you hear, it should lead to action. Does it? I uh, was doing something this week and and I really wanted to, to say something in, a, in an interaction that I had, but I knew what I was preaching on. I was like, oh, convicted. I got to listen to my own preaching. I can't always do what I want to do because it's, it's not hearing the word and, and doing what he wants me to do. He goes even further here. He doesn't just say it's a good thing and you should do it. He says, if, if you're not doing it, you should reflect on whether you're even saved at all. Are you really a Christian? Has the Spirit really changed your heart? Are you learning and growing what it means to be more like Jesus? Or are you just looking in a mirror and seeing what you should do? Oh yeah, that sounds good. And then Monday comes along, you're like, ah, nah. Intellectually understanding it, but not putting it into action. You're just as good as if you never looked in the mirror at all. A fake or phony. So many churches are filled with religious experts who have never had life change in meeting Jesus. Repentance has never come. They've never asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of their life. They, they know Scripture. They go to church. They give some money. They, they do some good stuff. But they've never put truly into action. They've never really received Jesus. Um, this analogy of a mirror is, is kind of interesting here. Um, I, I've not looked in the mirror as much in my life as I have the last six months. Now, I'm not becoming more vain. It's because Owen loves to look in the mirror, uh, my son, and it's one of those progression things. And so we play a game where he can't see in the mirror, and then I bring him up and look him in, and he looks, and I go, ah, and he laughs, and then we go down. And I, it's a fun little game that I play with him. But I've never looked in a mirror as much. So I was like, how many mirrors do I have in my house? Started counting them. And then I realized every kid's toy has a mirror on it. So I stopped counting. I was like, that's too many for me to count. And uh, so many mirrors. Here's the important thought, though, that James has. Mirrors, yes, they reflect it a little differently, right? It's opposite, right? Touch your left ear, it looks like your right ear. But mirrors don't lie. They reflect exactly what you are. And he's saying right here that as you look at Scripture, God's Word, the law, if you're truly looking at it like you are in a mirror and reflecting on it, What's going on in my life? What's my thoughts, my actions? What's my beliefs? Truly reflecting on it, it is going to convict you and you're going to see who you are. Oftentimes we look at Scripture and we, we kind of pick and choose what we want to see. But if you're looking in a mirror, you see what you are. That's why many people don't look in mirrors. They don't want to see what they are. They're not happy with what they are, the way they look. But not just physical, your spiritual life, your choices. Are you reflecting on who you truly are in Christ. The ancient Greek word translate, uh, translated looks or observing has the idea of careful scrutiny. In, the, uh, in this time, mirrors weren't as clear as they are today. So in order to see the reflection, you'd have to look a lot harder. And this is the analogy that they were getting. As you read Scripture, reflecting to a depth where it impacts not only what you think, but what you do. When you read the Bible, do you give careful scrutiny to what it's telling you, what it's teaching you, how you should be learning and growing? Making sure your life lines up with what you're reading. I love how uh, Pastor Stuart Elliott, uh, he, he names it this way, he says, it's not looking in the mirror, the mirror that changes a person, it's acting upon what you see in there. You can know the good you ought to do, but not act. You could hear good things, but not act. It's only when you hear and then go out and do that you're genuinely following Jesus as He calls you to. I hope that's what you're doing today. This is what intently looking into the perfect Lord does, invites you to see truthfully the reflection of how you're living. And the Bible often exposes us. But when you don't put into action what you hear, you're like the person that doesn't even look in the mirror at all and you're not saved. He goes on to say in verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Uh, I don't really think I need to explain that verse. That makes sense, doesn't it? I'll ask this question though. If your tongue reflects your heart, 
Would people say you're a Christian based on what they hear? Yikes. We close by looking at what James gives us as examples of what he's calling us to. Verse 27, religion, a faith that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. He's saying here that genuine Christian living means advocating for those who could never repay you. It means being for them, loving people generously. As we follow Jesus, there's a growth inwardly and an action outwardly. When you accept Jesus, there's a a change the Spirit does in your inward life that leads you to a change in your outward living. Put this way, growing inwardly, becoming more like Jesus, and reaching outwardly with the love of Jesus. This is our call. This is genuine Christian living, right? And I love when I see people in our church doing this, living as we're called sent. Changing our lives from the way we were, but not just so that we benefit, not just so that we can be with God, glorifying Him, but going out as we go in our lives, teaching, sharing the good news as we invite people to get baptized and learn what it means to receive the the true bread of life. There's so many ways you can do this. It's not a grandstand, big, like, oh, thousands of people came to know Jesus through me today. This is amazing. No, it's, I think, more in the small things. You're changing inwardly and outwardly. You go mow your neighbor's yard because they're elderly and they're struggling. You text the person that is struggling because they lost a loved one. You genuinely show that you love and care through how you live because Jesus has changed your soul, your heart. We said this last week at the, time, at the time they were writing. He's writing to these Christians that are scattered, suffering. There was no welfare system. But God is telling them, and He's telling us today, that His welfare system is us, His church. Are we living in a way where we're helping people, we're loving them generously, and inviting them to hear the good news of the gospel? Here's the truth. Jesus paid the price for me. I was in a debt I could never repay. He became poor for me gave up his riches so that I may be set free. Freedom. Now, I don't know exactly what that looks like for you to to live outwardly and love people generously, but I want us to live in this tension. God designed us to enjoy things. I see that through sunsets, through amazing things I get to experience. You can enjoy it. He wants you to enjoy things. But there's a tension between enjoying what we've been given and living as he calls us to provide for those in need. That's the tension to live in. That's the question for you today. What does it look like for you to invite people into a better way by loving them generously? With our time, absolutely. With our our money, absolutely. Belongings, absolutely. With our gifts, with everything we have. As we worship and glorify God, He calls us to be sent. These are the two keys to genuine Christian living. Hearing and doing. Don't lose one of those keys. Put both of them in the slots of life so that you can access what God has for you. Let's pray. God, we just thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this reminder, Lord, that you have a call on our lives. And as we grow to become more like your son, Jesus, you have so much for us to do, say. Ask, Lord, today that you would help us to pause as we hear your word, listening to the Spirit, being guided, Lord. It's only by your power and your goodness, your grace and mercy, that we get to do any of this. And we thank you. We love you. We pray in your name.